2009 for the Tuckahoe Seniors. Um, we are really privileged today to have Dr. Martin Stein, also known as Fritz Stein, uh, come and tell us about his experiences um, treating wounded veterans. We've known each other, oh, soldiers. That's right, they're soldiers. Yeah, active soldiers. Sorry. I'm mixed up because today we donated 30 of our lap robes to the veterans at Montrose Veterans Hospital. So I'm just going to turn this right over to you, Chris. It's a pleasure to, to be here. I would just ask you uh, initially, how many of you are veterans? Okay, so we've got some veterans here. Um, I joined the U.S. Army Reserves when I was an intern right after I finished medical school. So that was uh, quite a long time ago. Actually, it was in 1963. And I did that because I had about five or six years of uh, finishing my training before I would be uh, an internist and a nephrologist. And um, so I joined the U.S. Army Reserves and I put in six years, which was the obligation, and I uh, enjoyed my time very much. Uh, I had uh, one weekend a month with my military unit uh, in Brooklyn. And I actually um, uh, had one week every month where I went to various Army bases throughout the United States. And then because I was an internist, uh, they were also short of nephrologists, which is my specialty. That is, I take care of patients uh, with kidney problems and patients on dialysis. And so at Walter Reed, they had a shortage. And uh, so I used to go there for some of my two weeks in the summer. And sometimes uh, if they were really needy, they'd call me at other times. And I'd take a break and go and, and work at Walter Reed and various other hospital, military hospitals that also were short of nephrologists. Anyway, at the end of those six years, um, I practiced internal medicine and nephrology out in Long Island, a place called Manhasset. Some of you may know of Manhasset, North Shore Hospital. And I, I belong to about five or six hospitals out in Long Island. And I was also half-time <coughs> in the Bronx Veterans Hospital as a nephrologist, and I worked in their nephrology unit at the Bronx Veterans Hospital. And uh, obviously most of you don't know much about nephrology, but uh, uh, the me my mentor who invented the arteriovenous fistula for dialysis was the head of nephrology at the Bronx VA and what he discovered in terms of this uh, 
device that was used to uh, allow, instead of putting a tube in somebody's neck in a vessel or in their arm vessel, uh, they would create what we called a fistula in the arm and that would be used for their dialysis. So when they'd come, you would just put two little needles in the arm and they didn't have to have this big tube hanging out of their neck or their arms. So uh, Dr. Jack Semino, uh, the Semino fistula is used in every country in the world now that uh, has dialysis. And Dr. Semino, actually I spoke to him within the last week. Um, he lives up in uh, northern Westchester. Um, and um, so he really was, was my mentor. But once I finished my uh, job with the six years in the Army Reserves, if anybody had ever said to me, one day you'll go back in the Army, uh, I would have said, not me, you know, I'm, uh, I worked out in Manhasset, Long Island, and my mentor, Dr. Semino, one day said to me, uh, some of you have heard of St. Joseph's Medical Center in Yonkers? Yes, right. yeah, of course. Well, I was the medical director there and the chief of nephrology for over 35 years. And I retired from there about three or four years ago. But while I was there uh, and uh, uh, running the dialysis units and setting up new units and uh, 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 I started a residency program in the specialty of family practice, family medicine, and um, uh, that has been going now for about 35 or 40 years, and it's very successful and very busy. And they, uh, St. Joseph's puts out about 15 to 20 doctors boarded in family medicine, and they're all over the country, and many of them are in Yonkers and surrounding areas here. Anyway. Um, one day, uh, I was having lunch in the cafeteria in the middle of my busy day, and I was sitting with a doctor, a uh, friend of mine, he was the head of urology, and he said to me, you know, I'm in the Army Reserves, and he said, I am enjoying it so much, it is really wonderful, and he told me what he was doing. And that night I went home and I said to my wife, some of you may know Sheila Stein. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I said to Sheila, you know, Mike McGalley told me today that he's in the Army Reserves and uh, you have a one weekend a month uh, and two weeks in the summertime and that's your obligation. What would you think if I did that? Well, if you know Sheila, no, she said, you know, if you want to do it, do it. <laughs> so I figured I had already completed my obligation in the military, so I figured, you know, that sounds great and I always enjoyed the Army, I'm going to go back in that way. And so I went back in and I um, spent a lot of time at Walter Reed Army Medical Center. Uh, I went to the Army hospital in Hawaii. I went to um, Europe to Landstuhl Regional Medical Center in Germany three times back in the 1980s. Uh, I was busy with the units that I was working in in Brooklyn uh, and I had to travel all over uh, uh, New York State and all of the reserve units to uh, check on the doctors who were working in those units throughout our state and also in New Jersey and I really enjoyed what I was doing but I was also as you can imagine extremely busy at St. Joe's and so St. Joseph's Hospital so uh, when my uh, 20 years was finished uh, I retired from the Army and uh, was worked hard for a lot of years, actually a total of uh, uh, 45 years at St. Joseph's Hospital. And um, 
I, I really enjoyed that, but uh, I got a, another physician who worked with me, so he was really became my partner, and he has since taken over uh, as Director of Medicine and Chief of Nephrology there. Uh, Dominic Retta is his name. And so while he was there, uh, and I, uh, I said to him, would it work for you if I volunteered to go back into the Army and spent a number of uh, whatever they needed over in Landstuhl, Germany? This is after the war uh, started uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan. And Dr. Retta said, you know, that would be fine if you do that. So I have gone over to Landstuhl Regional Medical Center three times in, uh, in the last 10 years. Uh, and I was there the year before last for six months, and the other times each time for six months. And I must say, um, that was really a highlight of my whole medical career. Uh, I know all of you, particularly the veterans, but I hope all Americans see our wounded soldiers as the heroes of this country. And one thing that really bothers me is, and you've read this in the newspapers, that if the soldiers wind up having traumatic brain injuries, which is really analogous to a stroke, if they have that medical problem where they can't function, they can't think straight, uh, it's just like having a stroke. And most of them are also minus an arm or a leg, because when those IEDs go off near their head, uh, many times it's destroying their, uh, uh, their arms or their legs, or they have uh, severe abdominal wounds, or all kinds of horrible things. And uh, uh, it, it just really bothers me when I read in the papers that they don't get a Purple Heart because they have traumatic brain injuries. And so for all of you, I would say if anybody deserves a Purple Heart, they do, they do as they much do. as any they other do. wounded right. soldier. And I, I mean, I am rather outraged uh, that they are not given a Purple Heart because uh, their future is really in doubt. Some of them will improve enough to be able to be with their families and hold a job, but many of them can't. And it's not their fault. And to take away what they deserve, I think, is uh, a real shame. It's awful. It's awful. Anyway, um, I was lucky enough, I mentioned, to be at a lot of places and then finally went back to uh, Landstuhl. Landstuhl Regional Medical Center in Landstuhl, Germany is the largest military hospital outside of the hospitals we have here in the United States in the world. Uh, it is uh, 1,700 miles from Iraq and about the same from Afghanistan. Uh, the all of the wounded soldiers from Iraq and Afghanistan, I should say the severely wounded, if they're minimally wounded, sometimes they're patched up and they stay. But otherwise, uh, they come to Landstuhl, Germany. And so that hospital uh, has about 150 beds. It has never, ever been busier than it has been during this present war. I mean, it is, it is not only full, it is overflowing. They have had to open other parts of the hospital to make beds for our wounded troops. 75% uh, of the hospital, uh, both nurses and doctors, are reservists. And 25% are full-time medical physicians, uh, both women physicians and men physicians. Uh, our country obtained Landstuhl Regional Medical Center from the French and bought it from them. And it incidentally has not only the big hospital and then lots of buildings for uh, the staff to live in, 
uh, but it's got about 50 acres surrounding it. And uh, I mentioned to somebody here that if you're uh, an American, and if you're an American soldier in particular, when you leave the premises of the hospital, you could never walk around town like this in Landstuhl, Germany, or in any other town in Germany. There are 31,000 documented terrorists by the, go by the government of Germany who live in Germany. 31,000 terror true terrorists. And therefore, as you can imagine, many times they're trying to get through these 50 acres and sneak in. And many times when I was there, uh, the alarm would go off in the middle of the night and everybody would have to go out and, um, and they would, I mean, they would find certain evidence that, you know, the, uh, the terrorists were around. And so they had plenty of police and soldiers, armed soldiers and police, uh, guarding the premises. So it's, it's a rather dangerous place. Uh, it uh, used to be a wonderful ter uh, tourist place, as, as we all know. You know, Germany, like many other countries in Europe, uh, but they don't like Americans. Now, I'm not saying the true Germans don't like Americans. Of course they do. And they like our money, uh, maybe more than us, I'm afraid. Yeah. Um, but nevertheless, um, it's a wonderful hospital, and I really enjoyed my time there, and I would probably be back if my wife hadn't said to me, look, you've been over there six times, you're 72, that's enough, she said, that's enough. So here I am, I always listen to Sheila. Uh, that's disappointing, that we're having a hard time taking care of our boys over there. That's that's really a disappointment that you have to worry about your life there, you know? It's well, I, they they warn us a lot. So you, as long as you're careful. Fortunately, fortunately for me, my name is Fritz, and I speak German. <laughs> right. So when I go into the town, I just, talk, you know, I talk in German because I took it in both high school and college. My dad spoke German. Uh, his father spoke German and mother, and uh, so I grew up and, uh, and could speak the language. Um, but, and it is, I agree with you, it's sad. Uh, and uh, you, just, you just have to be very careful. I mean, I think if somebody like myself wore this uniform and went into town, um, uh, you're just, you're a sitting pocket. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. You never come home. Yes. Uh, the wonderful thing about these um, uh, flights from uh, the from Afghanistan uh, and and um, Iraq is that these huge planes that come in. I mean, when things were quiet over there, sometimes <coughs> we would get one or two planes a week. When things heated up, we would get maybe a plane or two every day. Each plane uh, has about uh, 50 beds, and it has doctors and nurses, and uh, you've all seen an intensive care unit in a hospital. Well, each plane has large intensive care unit type spaces, because many of the wounded, as you know, are really, yeah. uh, really severely wounded, and they need doctors and nurses right there to take care of them. Uh, it, it's amazing. Um, there have been over 100,000 wounded soldiers brought to Landstuhl, Germany. Over 100,000 uh, over the period of the war. Uh, in World War II, one in three wounded soldiers died. In Vietnam, one in four wounded soldiers die. In Iraq, one in eight die. So it gives you an idea that the care of the wounded has improved dramatically over these many years. 
Only 16 of the American injuries are from bullets, 16%. And the rest are these IEDs that blow up as the convoy goes past on the roads. The amputation rate of injured Americans in Iraq is 6%. Uh, I saw a number of people who were double amputees, lost both an arm and leg. Uh, and that's because of the ceramic uh, vests and Kevlar helmets that leaves the, the uh, soldiers' heads and their arms and legs uh, vulnerable. Uh, traumatic brain disease, 70% uh, of the injuries of traumatic brain disease are these uh, uh, incendiary devices that uh, blow up as you're as you either walk by or you're in a vehicle and go by. Uh, there have been, and, and I'm sure you realize this, but you probably don't think of it because I never thought of it, but every time there's a war, like the present war there in, in Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, there are tremendous breakthroughs in terms of caring for our wounded soldiers. <laughs> Uh, and a number of discoveries were made just with this present uh, business in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, while I was there uh, about three years ago, um, there were two soldiers where a bomb blast blew up and it really severely damaged their lungs so that they couldn't breathe. So they were put on American respirators, like we have in our, all of our hospitals. They were put on these respirators, and as many of you probably know, they put a tube down into the throat, and then the respirator breathes for the patient and gives them oxygen. Well, these two soldiers down there uh, were, were not getting better. They couldn't be moved on a, a plane, and they were really not going to make it. And the Germans have a new type of a respirator where instead of putting the tube down into your throat and breathing with oxygen that way, what they do is you uh, put a needle into a large vein, like a vein uh, right here, the, the large vein, or it could be in the arm, and they take out blood and they this German machine will put oxygen into the blood cells and then they put it back into the patient. And that's something new. And it was, uh, we don't have that yet in this country. But these two uh, specialists in pulmonary flew down to uh, the war zone with these German gadgets, they hooked these two fellows up to them. And lo and behold, they woke up and they felt better. And so they brought them back on a plane with this new machine. They had two of them that they took. And, uh, and these men are alive and off the respirators now. They have yeah. improved. So that's a major uh, breakthrough. And I, I have not yet heard that it has been approved for use in this country, uh, but uh, I would expect that if it hasn't, they're looking at it carefully and it will be uh, soon because this is really a major breakthrough. Um, there's another problem which I think you all can imagine. When somebody gets shot on the gun field, uh, they bleed. And if you don't get to them and stop the bleeding soon, that's what causes death. Yeah. And so now, with the planes landing to help wounded soldiers, uh, there's another new discovery that was found during this present conflict. And that is that uh, people who are bleeding profusely 
on the battlefield. If you can get to them, it has been found that shrimp cells, you go out and buy shrimp, in those cells uh, is something called chitin, C-H-I-T-I-N. And chitin, if you put chitin where somebody's bleeding, the bleeding stops. Yeah. And that was discovered also within the present war. And so when the medics go around, they have their uh, materials to uh, help wounded soldiers, but they also carry uh, these gadgets with chitin. And when they go to a soldier who's bleeding and put this chitin on, the bleeding stops. And so they don't necessarily immediately have to transfuse everybody, but they can, you know, Call, stop the bleeding and then get them in an airplane and take them to the hospital. And so that's another major uh, uh, discovery. Um, one day I was um, at the hospital, and I have to tell you what my, my routine was um, uh, at the hospital. Uh, I worked in, uh, well, I've been there a total of six times. So I have worked in the emergency room taking care of people that are brought in there. Uh, I have worked on the medical floors. Uh, I have worked in the clinics there. Um, and uh, my usual job was being a nephrologist, first of all, I was generally the only person there if some of the wounded soldiers' kidneys happened to shut down, um, which happened probably at least once a month. Uh, I would be the one who would get them on a kidney dialysis machine and uh, if their kidneys weren't working and treat them uh, with dialysis uh, and then figure out what we had to do to get their kidneys back working. Uh, and so that was something that I could get a call in the middle of the night or any time uh, with. and. Uh, uh, there wasn't a whole lot of that, but probably each time I was there, I probably did it uh, at least once or twice a month uh, for patients that were brought in that were severely uh, injured. One day I received a call from St. Joseph's Hospital, and they said, did I remember uh, this lady um, uh, who, were, who started the gift shop there? And, uh, and, and they gave me the name, and she was kind of famous, and my wife, Sheila Stein, worked in the gift shop, so she knew her. And anyway, her great uh, nephew was in some hospital in Germany. That was the message I got on email. And so could I check it out? So uh, that day, I went up to the intensive care unit, and I asked, uh, do we have a patient up here named Timothy Ryan? And the, uh, the people said, yeah, you see that bed over there? That's Tim Ryan. He was in deep coma and on a respirator, so he wasn't able to respond. But in the room was his mother, his father, his grandmother, his grandfather, and his sister. And they were uh, keeping a 24-hour vigil. The mother stayed in that room 24 hours every day. She slept on a little couch somewhere, but she stayed with her son. So uh, one of the things I did was I, uh, I got to know the family very well. I went up there and saw them every day and spoke to them. And um, uh, I called St. Joseph's, and I got the uh, priest at St. Joseph's to start a prayer vigil for him at St. Joseph's, and uh, lo and behold, he, although he didn't wake up in Germany, he was transferred to Walter Reed, and the family went with him in a plane. And then I heard he was markedly improved, and he went to a VA hospital down in Washington. And then the family was able to take him back home, and he lives uh, uh, near Lake Katrine and Albany, New York. And uh, so I 
uh, went and visited him uh, when I got back and saw the family and uh, uh, lo and behold, uh, he's doing amazingly well. He's markedly improved, he's talking, he's walking, um, and the family, you know, that family support uh, means everything in the world. I, everybody knows that. You know, if you're in a strange place and you don't have family with you, uh, it's not nearly uh, as therapeutic as when your family is with you. And needless to say, he's doing great. And my hat goes off to his parents because they, uh, uh, they are really wonderful uh, people. And I must say, the community uh, in upstate New York where they live, uh, they have been very supportive of, uh, of this soldier who really, uh, um, I don't think he's able yet to go to work or do anything much, but um, as he recovers, uh, I hope that will happen. But the people in the community have raised lots of money to help the family and help him. And, and that's also a, uh, a wonderful thing. Uh, another thing that uh, before I went over there each time, a number of my friends, uh, they, they would sort of have a going away party for me each time I went over there for six months. And, um, and they would say, you know, we want to do so, well, what can we do? What can we do? And so I said to them, well, I'll tell you, the thing that I find is the most exciting thing for these wounded soldiers who are lying in bed, um, the ones that can talk and see. Um, but the one thing they love is to be able to phone their families, their loved ones, their spouses. And so, each time I went over there, I would collect these, uh, you've probably heard of these uh, AT&T colon cards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they have, uh, the ones that I used to hand out, I mean, I always had a pocket full of these things, and I used to hand them out every time I saw a soldier, even if he was walking. I mean, if, I, if, if he was there at the hospital and he was even a little bit wounded, you know, I'd go up to him and say, would you like it? mother, whoever, and nobody ever said no, of course, and um, I mean, it meant the world to them, and um, I would say each of the times that I was over there, I mean, I probably had spent thousands of dollars with these things, but that gave me a lot of joy because I never saw these wounded soldiers smile and be as grateful is when I would say, here, here's 200 minutes. Call your mother, your girlfriend, or whoever you want to call. So that was a great, uh, a great way to enjoy um, uh, what I did over there. Uh, I came back from Germany each time really feeling good about the quality of the care that these soldiers got. Uh, Everybody, the nurses, the doctors, the whole, the staff, the people that worked in the cafeteria, everybody was dedicated to these wounded soldiers. And I know my wife came over on a several occasions. Um, she didn't see much of me because I was very busy. Um, but fortunately, she is a book reader, so she spent a lot of time reading books. <laughs> Uh, and also she uh, exercises, so she goes around the base. Um, and we would have uh, many times uh, uh, dinner together. And um, so she enjoyed her time, and then I might get a couple days off and we'd take a ride somewhere. So we, you know, we enjoyed that. Uh, but, but I really had a good feeling quality of the care that our wounded troops got was first class. Uh, I never saw any hesitation. 
the neurosurgeons were there. Whatever the problem was, it was dealt with and dealt with well. Now, the hospital there, I'll tell you something that you're not going to believe, because I couldn't believe it. Every single day, a baby is born in that hospital. <laughs> so you know what that means. The soldiers who are stationed over there have their families there. Seven days a week, there's a baby born. So uh, the obstetrics and gynecology division is very busy. And that was a surprise to me. I, I didn't expect it. But I had heard maybe about 15 or 20 years ago that they were going to shut down a lot of the bases in Germany. But I think with what's happened, they haven't shut many down. They maybe shut a few, but they still have thousands of troops in Germany all over the place. We do. I mean. And obviously it's for a reason. You know, that, uh, uh, as I said, there have been over a thousand wounded troops coming in. And so we need um, uh, a good military hospital that can take care of literally everything. Once in a while, we would have a shortage of a neurosurgeon. But whenever that happened, we, we would get uh, uh, a German neurosurgeon to sort of take over. But I'd say 95% of the time, we did have our own neurosurgeon. Uh, so I, what I have to say, and, and I've given um, uh, talks like this to uh, a number of um, my colleagues who are physicians, both in training and attending physicians. <laughs> I'm told at St. Joe's, uh, because every, to every new incoming group of physicians, uh, I would give a talk, and I would talk up the military, and I probably did get about 100 doctors to sign up as I did, because they would hear my story and say, wow, that sounds great. And I keep up with a number of them. In fact, I emailed one of them today who went back to Landstuhl. He's a psychiatrist, um, and which leads me to tell you, what do you think is the busiest uh, service in that hospital? Psychiatry. Yeah, yeah, You're right. Yeah. Because it is obviously so stressful for our troops that the psych unit is always overflowing. Good question. Yes. Truthfully, how did you find the morale of the boys, of the wounded especially? Do they really know that we're behind them? Or is there a doubt or what? I read things in the paper that are disturbing sometimes. Um, what I have to say is that even the ones who were severely wounded, I, so many of them would say to me, Doc, you got to help me. I gotta get back to my unit. I mean, they were the most dedicated people I have ever met. I didn't meet anyone who wasn't. And for me, to see somebody who's minus an arm and or a leg or severe abdominal wounds say, Doc, you gotta get me better. I gotta get back to my unit. You know, it's unbelievable. So I, I have to say that 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 their morale was good. They wanted to get better. They wanted to get back <coughs> with their buddies. And they were the most dedicated people. Uh, but I have to tell you something else. Never did I ever leave the intensive care unit. I went up there every morning before I had to be someplace else to go through and see people because I, you know, I wanted to keep track of them and I, if they needed another calling card or whatever. And I did that every morning early, and every night that was the last thing I did. I never left the ICU without tears in my eyes. Because I've got uh, three sons, mm -hmm. and uh, I know what it's like. And, I, you know, I have never seen anything quite like that. That they are the most dedicated people I have ever met. That's so, it, for me, it was... Uh, <coughs> It was a wonderful experience. It was a highlight of my whole medical career. And I'm just really grateful that I learned of it and had the opportunity to go and serve. Because 
you know, I, uh, I certainly enjoyed uh, working at St. Joe's for 45 years, but this was kind of a break. It was something different, and I really felt like I was needed over there needed. every time I went. Yeah. Uh, there were times when we, they were short of neurosurgeons, I told you, and, uh, you know, if you've got somebody with a severe brain injury and you don't have a neurosurgeon, you know, you feel really lost. Um, fortunately, we would get the Germans to come over and they would they would help out, and it, also it didn't happen much. Yes. Were you ever wounded, Colonel? No. no. I didn't, I didn't, uh, I wasn't on the battlefield. I was in the hospital. Yeah, taking care the battlefield to get wounded. I'll tell you, I got wounded in Bronxville. <laughs> 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 Uh, no, it was a haagen ice cream truck. <laughs> I was running down Pondfield Road. This was 19, uh, uh, 1981, uh, I believe. And it was 6 o'clock in the morning, pitch black. And I'm running on Pondfield Road, and I see these headlights on high. So here I am, you know, with my shorts on, running down. I have my dog with me. And I see these headlights, and I say, oh, that was better get next to the curb. So I made sure they were right next to the curb, and when the truck went past me, since it was black out, I couldn't see the loading platform was open. Oh. Oh. And the loading platform went through this leg, oh. right here. Oh my and you know this is the femur bone? Yeah. yeah. It went right through the femur. Oh, and it flipped me around, and I landed sitting down, and both ends of my femur was sticking out of my leg. And I had a puddle of blood, and it was pitch black, and the driver never heard, because that's way in the back of the truck. So I'm sitting down there, and finally a police car came, and my wife was the mayor then, so the policeman said, um, uh, called the, the police station and said, um, call the mayor and tell her her husband's in the street, <laughs> bleeding, bleeding. So she came with, with uh, uh, our daughter, Maggie, who was just little. And here I am sitting in the street. There's no ambulance, there's no, you know, nobody. I'm just sort of sitting there. So she went up to a house. Everything was pitch black and banged on the door and, and she said, could I have a towel? <laughs> So at least I got a towel there. The ambulance only took about 45 minutes to get there. It took me to Lawrence, and uh, thank God, you know, I was in the operating room soon after. Yeah, anyway. So be careful when you're walking in the street, please. Any other questions? Okay, well, I, I enjoyed... Uh, Talking with you all. Not only did he have that dreadful accident, he's recovered completely. Walk for them, Fritz. <laughs> he really is an exceptional, exceptional person, and we're lucky to have him today. Dr. Stein also gave the same program to the Bronxville seniors, and I just want to put a plug in for the Senior Citizens Council, who is the agency that sponsors both the Bronxville seniors and the Takao seniors, and your wife is on our advisory board, and I just... She advises me, too. Oh, does she? <laughs> <laughs> She's a general. <laughs> but this is an example of some of the really exceptional programs we're able to have, and we're open Tuesdays and Thursdays, and for those seniors who don't know about us, uh, we would like them to come and visit us. Thanks again. Thank you.